Within 30 years of the invasion, there were 60,000 Roman troops in Britain. They'd come from some of the most advanced places in Europe, and to them, this sort of settlement must have seemed primitive. This is the story of how they transformed the landscape and laid the foundations for the countryside and the cities that we have today. When the Romans arrived, Britain was divided into 33 kingdoms, each one a hill fort surrounded by tiny agricultural communities like this reconstructed one at Buxa in Hampshire. The native Britons lived in large circular houses. The buildings had timber framework, wattle and daub walls and thatched roofs. They spent their time farming and raising livestock and made a comfortable living off the land. The Romans thought they were uncivilised barbarians and immediately set about transforming Britain into a province of the civilised Roman Empire. But the Romans did know the Celts were good farmers. In fact, that was part of the reason why they came. The chieftains had been making a grain surplus and were already trading it with people in Gaul. Well, the Celts may have been doing all right on their own, but they were in real trouble when all these foreign troops moved in. It's been calculated that to feed one legion for a week would have taken something like 5,000 litres of grain, which would have corresponded to something like 7,000 loaves of bread. What's more, there were four legions and at least as many auxiliaries. So obviously, the output of grain was going to have to be increased. The Romans set about introducing intensive farming methods. They brought in new crops like turnips and carrots, and they drained marshes so more land could be put under the plough. They also made some significant improvements to farming tools. The Celts may well have used a simple plough like this one. It's called an ard, and you can see it's just two pieces of wood. There's a point here which digs into the soil and makes a furrow, a sort of drill, into which you can sow your seed. And then there's the handle which simply slots in, so it's very easy to make and very easy to repair if you break it. The Romans almost certainly improved this by adding an iron ploughshare. Now this would have been much better at cutting through the soil, particularly the heavy northern soil. And later on, they improved it still further by adding wheels to stop the whole plough from sinking into the ground. They also invented some multi-purpose tools. Even the ordinary bill hook like this, the Romans adapted by adding an extra blade on the back. That meant that one workman could do a variety of different jobs. For example, you could trim off a piece of wood like this. Look at that. Terrific. This multifunctional gadget is over 1,700 years old and made of silver and iron. It has to be the forerunner of the Swiss Army knife. As well as an ordinary spoon and fork, there's a tiny spoon, perhaps for scooping up spices, a spike, possibly for opening oysters, and something that looks remarkably like a toothpick. It's a fantastic design. More efficient ways of working the land gave people the freedom to go off and do other things. Many headed for the military camps where there was money to be made providing goods and services for the well-paid Roman army. Growing trade and commerce helped the development of early settlements alongside the forts. These eventually became Britain's first towns and cities. One of these was York or Ibaracum, as the Romans called it, strategically sited in the homeland of the rebellious Brigantes tribe who lived between the Humber and the Scottish lowlands. Ibaracum began as a military settlement, but it soon spawned an important civilian town which eventually became the capital city of the northern province of Roman Britain. 
York may be best known as a Viking stronghold or a medieval city, but its roots are Roman. And if you look carefully, there are clues to its early occupants. I've been navigating around York using a map of the Roman city, and it's rather interesting. I've just come up Via Praetoria, that's Headquarters Street, and I've met the junction with Via Principalis, that's the Main Street, High Street, now become High Petergate. And you can see they built the whole thing in a square, and they laid out all their streets in a grid pattern, like a modern American city. In fact, this kind of street layout is one of the key characteristics of a Roman town, and one of the empire's lasting legacies. Each new town followed a standard blueprint inside a defensive wall. This design was so successful that future generations built directly on top of the Roman foundations. This is one of the fortress towers. Now the top bit is medieval, you can see the big bricks and the arrow slits, but the bottom bit is all Roman and we know that it's Roman because of that decorative band of orange tiles about seven feet off the ground. That's almost a trademark of Roman construction. The centre of York is dominated by the Minster, the most impressive building in the city, right in the middle, which is exactly where the Romans built their most important building, the Basilica, of which the remains are still there. The Minster is built right on top of the original Roman building. The evidence is down in the crypt. This is a little building, outhouse, built on the side of the basilica, the main town hall and meeting place. And this was a Roman road, which would have had soldiers marching up and down. And just so that they didn't get their feet wet, this was a drain collecting all the rainwater and taking it off down towards the river. Well, archaeologists didn't believe it could still be working 2,000 years later, so they put some dye in here, and it came straight out in the River Ouse, half a mile away. Even in one of the pubs, you can find revealing traces of Roman York. Down here in the basement are still the remains of the Roman military bathhouse, where the legionary would have come in his time off for a bit of rest and recreation. And over there, you can still see the foundations of the hot room, the, the steam room. Getting rid of all that dirty bathwater needed more and bigger drains. Believe it or not, beneath this very street, just five metres down, there's a 2,000-year-old sewer. Going down into a sewer is a dangerous business. There may be toxic gases, so the specialist team need breathing apparatus. They're taking a camera, which will send pictures back to the surface. Okay. The archaeologist who's made a study of this sewer is Patrick Ottaway. OK, so, Patrick, what are we seeing? What's that muck at the This is fantastic, street? actually. We're looking at the main channel of the Roman sewer here. We can see the small stones there, which are typical Roman work. Limestone, small limestone blocks. And then we've got a stone at the corner there, which has been specially shaped to encourage the flow to go round the corner here. It's actually concave. It has a concave face. So as the material washes down here, it rushes round the corner there. So they actually carved this out to, to, to make, make stuff go around the corner? It's specially placed in there. It's a special technique for getting the stuff to flow well around the corner. Oh, That's brilliant. Right. OK, so can we drive the camera forward? Why does the sewer have to be so big? It has to be big because it's taking an enormous amount of water and latrine material every day, probably about 70,000 gallons a day. 70,000? Yes. So there were, what, 5,000 people here in the...? 5,000 legionaries and a certain number of uh, other hangers-on, and they all want a bath every day. They're all using the loos all the time, so you can imagine that there's a lot of material coming down there. So what have you found down these sewers? Well, we excavated the sewer here and we found things that people had dropped in the baths or dropped in the loo. And we've got a lady's gold earring. A, a lady's gold earring? Mm. This is a military barracks? That's right. But you see, some of the officers were kept their wives here. That was allowed. Oh, really? Yeah. OK. And we've also got gaming counters. 
um, the Romans used these baths as a sort of leisure centre, so they would play games, you know, they loved to gamble, the Romans. Other evidence from the excavation of this sewer gives us information about who built it. We find lots of tiles which have the stamp of the Roman legions on, and I have a piece here, and this is a stamp which says L E G I X, which means Ninth Legion. Ah. And they built the sewer. The men of the Ninth Legion, who were so proud of their tiles and everything they did, they sort of stamped them. You know, whenever <laughs> they, could. they would have built this thing here. And um, it's still in very good order. It stood the test of time, and it'll be there, I would imagine, long after all the Victorian sewers and the modern sewers have, dis have disappeared. Yeah, it, it was built to last, and it has done. Roman sewers were a wonderful engineering achievement and the hallmark of civilized urban living. In other parts of the empire, evidence remains of high-rise apartments and street lighting. The Romans also introduced the concept of glass windows. Windows were just holes in the wall for most houses, perhaps with a security grill. But the evidence suggests that by about AD 100, the rich householders were putting in panes of glass to let the light in without letting the heat out. The recipe for Roman glass is well known, but exactly how they made flat window panes has been a bit of a mystery. Mark Taylor thinks he's come up with the answer. Move that forward, please, David. A flattened disc of molten glass okay. must be kept hot to keep it flexible. Early theories suggested that molten glass was poured into a mould, but Mark thinks it was somehow pulled into shape. So you just have to tease it out until it's big enough? Yes, uh, I don't think we've, we're quite hot enough in here. I can't really get this uh, furnace much hotter. Um, but it does rely on areas of the glass staying cold and other areas getting hot. So I've got something to pull against when I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing the cold part and pulling it away from the hot part and the hot part stretches. OK, David. Fragments of early Roman window glass have been found with distinctive tool marks on their edges, like those on Mark's glass, which convinces him that they were pulled into shape. It stays lovely and flat, doesn't it? It settles down on the, on the surface each time. It does, but the danger is if it gets too hot, then it's going to start to stick to the backwash. Uh, so it's a case of experience and judgment and not allowing it to get too hot. But then glass blowing arrived and the Romans found a new way of making window panes. First, Mark blows a bubble of glass. Then he spins it round his head to stretch it into a cylinder. OK, that hopefully will do. He then attempts to split the cylinder down the middle. Oh, there we are. Back in the furnace, it's heated up until it becomes pliable. Then he simply has to tease it open into a flat pane of glass. This technique of making windows was a major step forward. Although the Phoenicians discovered glassmaking in 2000 BC, it was the Romans who adapted the process for mass production. It's one reasonably flat piece of glass. This is the cast glass made by pouring onto a slab, and you can see it's pretty rough, it's translucent, it lets the light through, but you can hardly see through it, it's not transparent. It'd be good for your bathroom windows. This is the one made from a cylinder, opened out, and you can see it's much, much clearer. It's a lovely piece of glass, that. It's much thinner than this one, 
and it's got many fewer bubbles in it. It's altogether a much better piece of glass and you can make bigger windows with this method. Did you know the Romans used to go out to cafes and snack bars for fast food and takeaways? You could get hot breads and meats, you could get pies and pastries, you could get sausages and something even more amazing. Now, I'm following a first century recipe written by a chap called Apicius. I've got my ground beef here. I need just a dash of this fish sauce and some pine kernels and a little bit of defructum, that sort of sticky wine. And I'm going to mix that all together nicely in here to make a nice gluey lump. And that needs to go in the frying pan and onto the fire. Now, that's going to take a few minutes to cook, so here's one I prepared earlier. And I'm going to put this between two bits of bread and lo and behold, I've got what looks to me like a hamburger. Open kitchen fires in timber-framed buildings must always have been a fire hazard. And presumably, early firefighting methods were little more than a bucket of water and perhaps an axe to chop down burning timbers. Then, in first century Rome, the Emperor Nero insisted that every single household should have some means of putting out a fire. And believe it or not, they actually had a primitive sort of fire extinguisher. It was made with eggs like this. You have to take your egg and separate out the whites. And there we are, a lot of, lot of white of egg there, and there goes the yolk. And then you add vinegar. It's like a sort of hollandaise sauce gone wrong. And you whisk them up together like this. Whisk, 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 whisk. And the idea is you chuck this mixture on the fire. The theory being that the vinegar penetrates to the heart of the fire and the egg white forms a protective layer on the top and keeps out the oxygen. Well, I'm a bit dubious myself, but I have to try it out. Right, we've got a good fire. Now, the question is, will this put it out? Well, it's not bad. Not bad. It's sort of almost out. There's a bit of smouldering going on, but I have to say that it does seem to work on a small fire. But some Roman towns and cities were razed to the ground by fires that burnt out of control. There were fire brigades, brave bands of slaves known as the Familia Publica, who were sometimes not above a spot of corruption and demanded money before they began to put out the fire. However, there is tantalising evidence they may have had the technology for a really good fire extinguisher. This weird object is a bit of a mystery. It's basically a hollowed out tree trunk with pipes fitted into it. But x-rays show that inside the lead pipes there are pistons, so it looks as if it might have been a pump. What could it have been used for? Well, it was found 40 metres down a well in Dorset, so it could have been for pumping the water out of the well, or for filling baths, or for running a fountain. But there is just the possibility that it was the basis of a fire engine. Avon Fire Brigade are helping to test out a pump made to a Roman design. The pump was made by Henry Russell, an expert in ancient carpentry, and is based on that block of wood with the lead pipes, as well as on ancient writings. That's fantastic. It's out. Brilliant. OK, OK, stop, stop, stop. We will get soaked. That is absolutely fantastic. Henry, congratulations. That's a most wonderful pump. 
What, what is this? A camel's head on top? It's a, a kangaroo. A kangaroo. <laughs> a ca yeah, very appropriate, yes. That is the most fantastic machine. I have to know how it works. Can we take it to bits? Yeah. OK, let's do it. Oh, it's a nice fit, isn't it? So what happens in here? This is, this is the um, central chamber, which... Ooh, there we go. Right. It basically contains two little flap valves. Yeah. One-way valves made of leather with a little lead weight. Tell me how the water gets into this block in the first place. Well, there's, a, there's an entrance, a hole, actually on underneath the block. Here, oh, yeah, okay. Which is, which is right below the bottom of the cylinder. And then where does the water go from here? Uh, basically, the only exit, as long as there's, the seals are all fine, is up this pipe, which leads to the top of... Out the spout. Out the spout. You can see more clearly how it works in a cross-section. As the piston on the right pushes down, it forces water upwards into the central chamber and out of the spout. At the same time, water refills the cylinder on the left. When that piston is pressed down, the process is repeated, so there's a continuous flow of water out of the pump. Extinguishers like this are supposed to squirt at least 7 metres, so that the operator doesn't get burnt. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. I would say that's certainly about seven metres. The question is, can our Roman fire engine squirt as far? That's terrific. I reckon that's going seven metres. It would pass the British standard at that rate, Henry. Absolutely brilliant. These pumps disappeared with the fall of the Roman Empire, but they re-emerged to much the same design in the Middle Ages. Another example of reinventing what the Romans did for us. Right now, let's get it right up that wall. The Flying Gardener is about to touch down and touch up some greenery over on UK TV Style Gardens. Next on History, the long straight roads that form the arteries of an empire are examined in what the Romans did for us. Mm -hmm.